Major funding for Wisconsin Stories is provided by the Mead Witter Foundation, Incorporated, Wisconsin Rapids, Wisconsin. Additional funding is provided by the Halbert and Alice Kadish Foundation. Philip J. and Elizabeth B. Hendrickson. And an advised fund of the Community Foundation of Southern Wisconsin. We're standing in front of the offices at Bucyrus International. That's a six-story office building. On this diagram, we'd be right down here. And this is a drag line made in the plant right behind this office building. That's a really huge machine. And making huge stuff creates huge challenges involving highly skilled workers who handcraft a machine piece by piece. And there's a special pride that comes with working on the really big stuff. When the Bucyrus Steam Shovel and Dredge Company moved to South Milwaukee in 1893, it brought with it a strong reputation for building specialized excavation equipment. So it was no surprise that in 1905, Bucyrus Steam Shovels were chosen to take on the huge job of digging the Panama Canal, which meant moving an estimated 225 million cubic yards of earth. When President Theodore Roosevelt inspected the site in 1908, he posed on board a 95-ton Bucyrus shovel. By the time Bucyrus bought the Erie Steam Shovel Company in 1927 and became known as Bucyrus Erie, its equipment was being used in other big projects around the world. As time went on, shovels were mounted on tracks, power changed from steam to gasoline, then to diesel and electricity. And as the jobs got larger, so did the machines, with buyers demanding bigger and bigger models. Bucyrus International's biggest shovels and drag lines are still made in the company's South Milwaukee plant. At the South Milwaukee Community Center, formerly a club for Bucyrus employees, I met with some retired Bucyrus workers. When you first walked into Bucyrus, how did it feel? Big, really big. What were the thoughts that went through your mind? When I first was hired as a machinist, I said, man alive, will I ever be able to operate these things? <laughs> and there, there's, there's no comparison of different machine tools. This is still really different than, say, um, car manufacturing. Yeah, oh yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Right. That's assembly yeah. line. They didn't have an assembly line as such. <laughs> no. Mm -hmm. no. There might, might have been a, a dozen machines being made at, at one time. There were parts for all of them. Uh, uh, laying on the machine shop floor or, or, or down on the erecting floor at, at the time. You assembled the whole machine as, on the small ones. On the larger ones, we assemble them in sections. And the sections are tested and shipped out to the field. And there they are assembled. We cannot build them up here, they're too large. For sheer size, as well as creative design, the 4250W walking drag line is another significant example of Bucyrus Erie capability. I remember the uh, 4250, the big muskie, which has now served its time. It, it's, it's down, it's finished. Uh, that was 330 rail cars, I believe, that took <coughs> that from here over to Cadiz, Ohio in the early 60s. 330? 300, rail, 300 plus rail cars took it over there. Big muskie was a walking drag line that was purchased by the coal company in, uh, in Ohio to mine coal mm -hmm. for electricity. And at the time it was um, decided, shall we buy two machines at 110 cubic yards each or one at 220 cubic yards each. It was decided for one machine at 220 cubic yards. And to date that has been, it's not existing anymore, the largest mobile land machine in the world. Now that big drag line, how long did that take to make? I'd say over a couple of years. It took a year to erect it in the field alone. One year to oh, just yes. put it together. Yeah. The best part of a year to put it yeah. together. You could dig easily on one end of the football field and dump it at the other end of the football field. No problem. To add a little bit to Rudy's thought there, he would dig at the goal post of uh, one football field, sitting at the other end of that field, and swing around and dump it at the goal post of another football field, yeah. and that's 600 feet yeah. away. That's the extent. That's the extent, yeah. 
Now, these are big pieces that you're working on. Some of them are big pieces. Right, and some are small. But you had to make them really accurately. Right, because you had an inspector to check them. <laughs> 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 Most of us plus one or minus one, but then we got sometimes bearings had to be within seven tenths of a thousand. Ten, seven tenths of a thousand yeah. of a what? Of a thousand. Uh, of an inch. Of an inch. Of an inch. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's, that's mighty small. No, you can't. Even, you can't <laughs> seven tenths, you can't even see how you. I've heard um, Chet call what you made the Cadillac of the industry. Oh, <laughs> definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Lincoln Continental, the whole works. <laughs> <laughs> how, how good are these machines? I you think know, I think at the time they were they they probably they were the best themselves in the yep. field they by, the, themselves by the, field. the customer themselves because that's why they bought so many of them. Mm -hmm. The competition for the big ones wasn't there until years later that other people caught up with the engineering uh, know-how to be able to do that. So it was always known as the Cadillac of the industry, and it was also known as Bissar Street was the bread and butter of our community. Yeah. So it's about the way it was. Wisconsin industry has long been involved in making big stuff. The large parts, heavy equipment, gears, and machinery that help build American industry. In this cramped storefront, Henry Harnischweger and partner Alonzo Pauling worked to make a better overhead factory crane, one that used electric motors in place of ropes and pulleys. Moving big stuff was becoming more and more essential to the many factories popping up around Milwaukee. Originally delivered by horse wagon, these Harnischweger cranes delivered the horse power to do the heavy lifting of many growing industries. Mel Anderson operated Harnischweger cranes here at A.O. Smith for more than 25 years. What's it like to operate a bridge crane? It's a tedious job. It's a job that you got to be careful. You got to be at your best in judging and safety. Sometimes you're working with men below. Oh yeah, always working with men below. What were your loads? Well, it was mostly pipe, uh, the gas line, the water pipe, the small pipe, the big pipe, and steel, like uh, the frame, automobile frame, from from the start to the finish. Did this pipe ever swing? I mean... Well, that's, that, that's the operator's. That's the operator's job to try to keep them from swinging, see. That's your job. That's my job, <laughs> see, see. See, that's why you tighten it up, you tighten it up, you tighten it up and shit, you know, just tighten it up. And if, if you get it straight, it won't swing when you pick it up, see. You got to practice it to get the, to get the feel of the job. Hell in that heavy load with people working down on the ground with you, see. Not every crane is used inside, of course. To build submarines during World War II, Manitowoc shipbuilding used their own Manitowoc speed crane. In fact, they made many more speed cranes than subs for the military, including six used for salvage at Pearl Harbor. At Milwaukee's Falk Corporation, crane operators had an important job besides hauling loads, warning workers when President Herman Falk was prowling the shop floor. The mechanically inclined Falk parlayed the profit from the sale of a family brewery into a business specializing in enormous gears. These massive gears were cast from molten steel. Gear turning gear transformed the power of electric motors into hundreds of industrial applications. Another Wisconsin company that made huge things was Beloit Ironworks, later Beloit Corporation. The company started out making replacement parts for paper-making machines. Eventually, Beloit made their own machines and won an international reputation by running a papermaker at the 1893 World Columbian Exposition in Chicago. As time went on, they built ever bigger and faster machines. Would you see those throughout Wisconsin? Throughout Wisconsin and throughout the world. Bob Fossler was a Beloit engineer who supervised the installation of paper making machines. To start a machine up, see it run for the first time, and then make paper, that's why you kind of went back and did the second and the third and the fourth one, you know, that was interesting. Big equipment, heavy. This equipment, when linked together, made for some of the largest machines in the world. 
What enters at one end as little more than wood pulp and water emerges more than a hundred yards later as crisp, clean rolls of fresh paper spooled up at speeds reaching 60 miles an hour. Companies that make big things, by their nature, take on huge risks. In the late 1990s, the Beloit Corporation ran into serious financial trouble. In the year 2000, the company held one of the biggest industrial auctions in the world as they were forced to shut down and sell off the company's assets. The Beloit Corporation was added to the list of Wisconsin companies that no longer make the really big stuff. largest facility of its type any place in the world. Well, it was a very, very diversified company that manufactured basically any industrial type product that you could almost uh, imagine. We made all uh, heavy uh, shafts for hydraulic turbines, steam turbines, uh, crushers. Big stuff. Big stuff, yep. Nobody else around that area or the States could make those big pieces. For decades, Alice Chalmers was the biggest company in Wisconsin, the biggest company with the most employees, at one point over 35,000. But no one works for Alice Chalmers anymore. By 1880, the Edward P. Alice Company was already Milwaukee's largest industry. It merged in 1901 with other heavy machinery makers to form Alice Chalmers. The biggest company also made some of the biggest stuff at its new West Alice plant. If all its buildings had been placed end to end, they would have extended two and three quarter miles. The plant had 21 miles of railway track, 162 cranes, and a total floor space of almost three million square feet. Today, the area where the Alice Chalmers factory grounds used to be is a strip mall. An overhead crane still hangs from the ceiling of a shoe store, a vivid symbol of the change away from our manufacturing economy. Part of the old Alice Chalmers plant is now the home of Regenco, a company that still services and repairs electrical turbines for Midwest utility companies. Alice Chalmers is gone, but not forgotten, by a group of retired supervisors and engineers who still meet for breakfast once a month and reminisce about their lives in the biggest job shop in the world. Do you think that the work at Alice Chalmers, because there was so much big <laughs> stuff, was it different than work in maybe other Milwaukee factories or other Milwaukee oh, plants? No doubt, no doubt it would. See, you got to consider that uh, most of the work that was done at the big stuff in Alice Chalmers was what they call job shop work. It was like one of a kind, two of a kind. If you want something made, nobody else can make it, we will. Some of the larger items Alice Chalmers made included hydroelectric turbines for power plants for the Tennessee Valley Authority and the Hoover Dam one of the world's largest hydroelectric installations. The first four turbines for the Hoover Dam were made in sections and transported on 150 rail cars to be joined together on site. The Alice Chalmers complex brought together the means to make big stuff. They had large overhead cranes, a huge plant, and highly skilled craftsmen. It was fun. Yeah. Is one of the things about Alice Chalmers is no day was the same. Everything was, was a challenge. Making huge stuff creates huge challenges. 
Alice Chalmers employees had to design the machinery, make it, put it together, test it, and then take it apart to ship it. And they would normally ship them in the, just the way the glass is sitting on a table, vertically, so you could clear the various wires and they would, they would go at the wee hours of the morning. What did you work on? What did you make? Originally? Yeah. Back in the old days? Yeah. Well, little shafts and uh, they would steam turbine parts. The most I enjoyed about Alice Chalmers was in my later years when I was in engineering and you take a drawing and you're actually, you're the father of this part, you know, you decide how you're going to make it and how much it's going to cost and you try to make it the most reasonable and then you go out in the shop and you actually, not supervise, but you're there while it's being made and, uh, and when it's all finished it's something that you created. Working for Alice Chalmers provided an interesting life for almost three generations. Some workers were employed by Alice Chalmers for 30, 40, 50 years. I had 42 years of uh, steady work. I never was laid off one day in all those years I worked. My father worked at Alice Chalmers for 40 some years. He was never laid off in all those years. Alice Chalmers was like a big family. Employment peaked with a shift to wartime production during World War II. America had started on the greatest program of military production the world had ever seen. But hard times fell on Alice Chalmers in the 1970s and 80s. The company entered into a joint venture with Siemens, a German electronics and engineering firm. And this was uh, probably a business decision that also led to our downfall. By 1988, Alice Chalmers faced bankruptcy and eventually sold its business to Siemens. Siemens, however, moved its production out of state and closed the West Alice operations in 1999. The end of an era of making really big stuff. Alice Chalmers was the largest plant in the area and you took a pride in your work. Well, I, I, I guess I'm proudest of the fact that it was a large family, it was really steady employment. You could provide for your family and uh, you could buy a house. I don't think any company had more talent than those shows. Why go through all the effort to preserve this stuff? This is our nation's history. If you don't know where you've been, how do you know where you're going? Now back here you got a, what's, what's this? Oh, just a big tank. Okay. Mm -hmm. In case we need a big tank for something. Okay, now here we're getting, they're saying some of your crane. What is this? This is a unit crane. It was built in Milwaukee. If you can lift it, you can swing it. Okay. But if you, if you have to reach out for it, you can't lift it. The crane will tip first. <laughs> Just one of those little idiosyncrasies that you have to live with when you run a crane. I'll remember that. <laughs> <laughs> what in the world is this? Well, this is a table for a boring mill. It's upside okay. down. In other words, it's easier if you have a big piece to lay it down than hang it up. <laughs> I'm Peter Berno, and uh, I've never really been able to separate my hobby from my business. I'm in a very fortunate position. I've carried on a lifetime love affair with machinery. Peter Berno operates what looks like a mechanic's junkyard. Old machinery parts and pieces weather in the sun. But he says everything here can and will someday be used again. Westinghouse. Nice. Very nice. Berno ran steam locomotives, all gone now, for the U.S. Army. He says he's been a shop man all his life, and his love of machinery led him to his lifelong work as a freelance engineer and his unusual hobby. He collects heavy machinery. Well, I collect to a certain extent mainly what I've worked with all my life. One thing I've always had a 
love for is overhead traveling cranes. Overhead cranes ride on tracks above a shop floor. They move big, heavy equipment from one side of a factory to another. Berno owns about 25 overhead cranes. They're stored outside in various locations, many of them deep in the underbrush, overgrown with weeds, grasses, and trees. But Berno says that's just the best way to preserve them. One of the problems that we've had in the past is vandalism. So this is a security device? This is sort of security. Several of the cranes he owns were made in Milwaukee by Pauling and Harnischweger. How many Harnischweger cranes do you have here? Oh, I'm going to guess probably 20. 20? Mm -hmm. Watch where you're walking here, because there's all sorts of little things hiding around in the grass. <laughs> well, this is like a, this is a different type of archive than I'm used to. <laughs> but that's really what this is, isn't it? Yes. This is a heavy equipment archive. And... How many uh, archives are there like this around the country? There are a lot of collectors like you? No. Why not? I really don't know. Probably because insanity is not that prevalent. <laughs> I think it's a, it's a dedication. Uh, this came from Alice Chalmers Foundry. Oh, really? Mm-hmm. Boy, this is a beauty. Now, this is also, yes, I see Pauline Harness. Yeah, this is a p &H. Oh, look how big it is, though. How the heck did you move this thing? <laughs> we just picked it off our truck with one of our cranes. <laughs> this is a toy compared to the ones that are over there. We've got a hundred ton crane Look, over there. Oh, those things are huge. Hey, watch out for the stinging nails. Let, let me, let's, Peter, let's go through this way. Okay. I think there's a piece of... There's, you're on a hook. What was the hundred ton crane used for and where did you get it? It came out of uh, Alice Chalmers and it was, it was their biggest of the older cranes. Peter Berno helped establish Thresherman's Park, located between Edgerton and Janesville. Every Labor Day weekend, ancient machinery comes to life, and operators demonstrate just how it works. This is what I'm told is the world's largest remaining steam shovel. Who built it? It was built by Bessiris Erie in, in Milwaukee. South Milwaukee. South Milwaukee. Bucyrus Erie was known for building specialized heavy machinery, and they built the shovels that dug the Panama Canal. This is bigger than the ones that used oh, the Panama yes, Canal? Oh yes, much bigger. Now you brought this here in pieces. How do you put it back together? With difficulty. <laughs> Berno hopes to have it up and running in the park by next Labor Day. And this is all put together to hold this To hold over this here. bucket. Tell me about this bucket. All right. Well, what's this made out of? This bucket is, is what's called a Misabi Dipper. Uh -huh. It was a special bucket that was designed for the abrasive uh, iron ore on the Misabi Iron Range. In terms of the uh, restoration, how much of this will have to be restored and how much can you uh, stand as is? Well, actually, I don't think outside of taking the shiv apart and going over some of the bearings, there's a great deal of restoration here, more cleaning and painting than anything else. Oh, what color will you paint it? Black. Black. Always black. <laughs> Cranes were always black. Why preserve this? Why talk about great men like George Washington or Thomas Jefferson? It's the same thing. Industrial heritage is the same thing? Yes. And when you stop to think, it was the industry, the things that we're looking at right now, that not only built this country, but made it great. A lot of them made in Wisconsin. Made in Wisconsin. Great big stuff. Yep. <laughs>